Welcome to Lightplay, using an external ambient lighting strip for video game indicators. This is work done by my graduate student Kim Pong Fang together with postdocs Katya Rogers, Stuart Halifax, undergraduate uh, research assistant Gabby Woodside, and my colleague Daniel Vogel. My name is Leonard Nacke, and I'll be walking you through this presentation today. Let's get started. So first I want you to have a look at this video game, um, fictional video game user interface here. We we're trying to get an idea of what is actually going on there. There's a lot of clutter on the screen. There's too many uh, user interface elements, and it actually makes the game almost unplayable. Uh, so it's a sort of a parody of how video games could look like. And so this was the starting point for us to think about visual indicators. Um, visual indicators provide important in-game information, but they can actually create um, clutter on the screen and they can consume a lot of the screen space. So we wanted to think about ways to make that more accessible and more user-friendly. So to address this, we developed an ambient lighting system for video game indicators using an LED strip that was attached around the back border of the monitor. As a teaser, our results show that ambient lights can capture attention 17.5% faster compared to on-screen indicators. And ambient lights performed at least as well as the on-screen indicators across all the other metrics. So we asked the question, how do ambient light indicators compare to traditional indicators? And we created a control study that compares speed, error rate, perceived workload of this approach with an on-screen baseline method. And here you can see how that's actually broken down in our experimental conditions. We created a Unity program that emulates traditional indicator outputs in a first-person camera view in video games. And then we placed the indicators at the top of the screen relative to the objectives in front of the player. And the same for objectives behind the player and behind the screen and um, to the left and to the right side of the monitor, um, depending on where the objective is. In um, column C there, in the third picture, you can see the right-hand side and the visual indicator on the left uh, uh, on the right uh, on the left side of the screen. Uh, if you look at it, it, looks at the right side, but the left side of the screen. So after determining the appropriate monitor side, the angle is then mapped to the number of LEDs that are available for the corresponding monitor. And we have 19 LEDs on the sides, 32 LEDs on the top and the bottom. And this information is then sent to the Arduino. The appropriate LEDs are turned on along with the two adjacent LEDs. So we've got total three LEDs that are turned on to produce this ambient light indicator effect and it's being updated as the player is aiming. And as we've already described, that's sort of our ambient light indicator method, but we also did an on-screen method. So one of the things that you have to keep in mind is the ambient light usually has a larger visual footprint. We try to emulate that as best as we can for the on-screen indicator. Um, so we use the same calculations that we sent to the Arduino, but instead we matched that to an on-screen indicator. And that integrator indicator position matched the number of LED lights available for the ambient lights on the sides of the screen so that they were exactly at the same location. Uh, we also implemented an audio condition where we used Unity's audio spatialization SDK to convert sound clips into 3D sound. And each target in the experiment had the same spatialized 3D audio source and the current target then emits that sound and it was a neutral consistent sound. Okay, so we had two tasks, primary task and secondary task, and the primary task was a reaction task with a stationary wall with nine white stationary boxes um, where targets were placed in front of the player. And of the nine targets, then we would always highlight with a black color and participants were told to aim their crosshairs with a mouse to follow the currently highlighted box. That's similar to shooting a weapon in a first person shooter. And as soon as the crosshair crosses over the targeted box, a new target is highlighted and the previous target's highlight disappears. So you have about five to 10 seconds um, for the indicator to appear um, and then depending on the condition, it's either an indicator from audio, on screen or ambient. And then the people had to press the space bar when they realized the indicator had appeared. Otherwise the primary task would continue. They'd have to select the next target. So once the space bar was pressed, the primary task, the wall and the targets disappeared and the secondary task started. For the secondary task, we had 16 white box targets that are placed evenly along the edge of a circle against the ground. The player is in the middle of that circle and we used the same HUD as the previous one. So we have the aerial view here same uh, type of clicking task, but the targets were not highlighted. So the participants in this case were dependent on the indicator for the selection. So just as the visual indicators updated continuously, the audio indicators updated as well. And each condition consisted of 15 trials, um, which with a, which a single target per condition, and the targets were randomly chosen from the pool of available targets. So the progression to the next target only occurred when the target um, was selected and other clicks were counted as errors. Okay. 
So here we can see that for the total time, it took significantly longer for audio than for on-screen or ambient indicators, about 53% faster. And this is largely due to selection time. We also looked at reaction time and selection time. Reaction time took significantly longer for on-screen than for audio or ambient, about 13 to 18% faster. And selection time was significantly longer for audio compared to on-screen or ambient, so 59 to 63% faster. And finally, we looked at the audio indicators and their significantly higher error, error rates so the incorrect clicks for the audio indicators compared to on-screen and ambient indicators. Quite interesting. Also, the visual indicators, the on-screen and ambient, yielded lower levels of mental workload, so a little bit easier to process, and on-screen scores were on par with ambient. So then uh, we also had a final post-study questionnaire consisting of ratings on navigation, immersion, and preference of indicator, and the audio cues uh, were rated as significantly higher than visual indicators for immersion. So this is also interesting, maybe a little bit more workload, but more immersive um, when you have those audio indicators. Whoops. Um, there was a slight preference for ambient light relative to on-screen indicators, and um, the preference may shift towards uh, strongly towards ambient light if personal configurations are available to the user. But you could say the majority voted for ambient, second most was on-screen, and then a few for audio. Ambient light outperforms on-screen indicators in reaction time, and this is an important result because it suggests that ambient lighting solutions could be considered over on-screen notifications when developing a system that has the purpose of getting a user's immediate attention. And this also returns screen real estate and increased potential configuration flexibility to the users. When a video game relies solely on audio to convey in-game information to the player, it only creates an accessibility barrier. Imagine a game where an enemy is approaching you, but the only indication of the action is footstep sounds. Without any other modalities in which this information is provided, this can be an accessibility barrier for you. For example, if you have hearing loss. So our system could be the foundation of an accessibility tool that provides visual indicators of in-game information independent from existing HUDs in the game. So it could be quite flexible and useful in that space. All right, thank you very much for your attention. This was a pretty fast presentation. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please feel free to contact me or any of the other authors here. Uh, you can find us on our website, hcigames.com. Thank you very much.